the small band is here. We're going to start with Luther's morning prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. <coughs> Keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, we're going to return to the Exodus Bible study this morning, and I'm going to give you a little quick overview, and yes, I will give you a video, because my brain could use it this morning, too. Um, lesson 13, if anybody needs a copy, I'll tell you what, I'm going to throw them right up here, Constantine, this one for you, and if you could take one and pass it behind you. So if you didn't have a chance to fill in the chart on the front page, this is just a reminder of where we started out this whole study uh, months ago. Basically, the Lord delivers his people from Egypt in Exodus 1 through 18. The middle section, chapters 19 to 24, he establishes his covenant with his people. And then finally, Israel enters into the place of the covenant. And we are roughly about, I think, chapter uh, 25 or so. Yeah, so we're just getting into the last third. And we started looking at the elements of the tabernacle. Um, what was supposed to go into it? What was the significance of it? And before we did that, the covenant um, basically had three covenants that Jesus was the fulfillment of. Does anybody remember what they were? Kind of, we kind of did it historically in reverse order from the most recent to the oldest, but he was basically what, Karen? Unilateral. Yeah. That's okay. Abrahamic? Yeah. Abrahamic. Yeah. So Davidic, Mosaic, and Abrahamic. And he's basically the fulfillment of all three of those covenants, one way, shape, or form. Okay? And then we carried the covenant thing to the next level, and there we go. Here's Jesus, the fulfillment of it. Which could mean different things in the Bible, like having God as a friend, or your father, or maybe your teacher. But there's one particular way that the Bible talks about this relationship that you find all over. But strangely, we don't talk about it that much. And that's the idea of a partnership with God. A partnership like working alongside someone to accomplish a goal together. Right, and this is actually what you see at the beginning of the Bible. God creates this good world full of all of this potential. And then God appoints these unique creatures, humans as his partners in bringing more and more goodness out of all that potential. But the humans don't want to partner with God. They rebel and try to create a world on their own terms. And so this broken partnership is the Bible's explanation for why we're stuck in a world of corruption and injustice and the tragedy of death. It's not like they're just one or two humans who have bailed on this relationship. In the story of the Bible, everyone has abandoned the partnership with God. So what God does is select a smaller group of people out of the many, and he makes a new partnership with them called a covenant. And in the covenant, God makes promises, and then in exchange asks his partner to fulfill certain commitments. And the purpose of all of this is to somehow use this covenant relationship to renew his partnership with everybody else. Now, there are actually four times in the Old Testament that we're told God initiates a covenant relationship with Noah, Abraham, the nation of Israel, and King David. And it's through these that God is forming a covenant family into which all people will eventually be invited. So let's see how these work. The first one is with Noah. So in this story, God has just brought a flood to cleanse the world of humanity's corruption, and Noah and his family are the only ones left. And so God makes a covenant with Noah, saying, listen, I know that humans will continue to be evil, but despite that, 
I'm not going to destroy it like this again. Instead, the earth will be this reliable place for us to work together. Great, so what does Noah have to do? Nothing. And that's what's so interesting about this first covenant, is that God is promising to be faithful, even though he knows humans won't be. The next time we see God make a covenant is with a man named Abraham. God chooses him, promises to bless him, give him a large family, lots of land where they can flourish. And in return, God asks Abraham to trust him and train up his family to do what is right and just. And the whole reason for this covenant is God says that somehow he's going to bring his blessing to all families of the world through this one family. So that's Abraham. The next time we see God make a covenant is when Abraham's family grows into the tribe of Israel. And this covenant is with the whole tribe. God asks them to obey a set of laws, which are these guidelines for living well as a community of God's partners. And if they do this, then God promises to bless them and that they will become a people who then represent him to the rest of humanity. That's the covenant with Israel. The last covenant is with King David. Yeah, the tribe of Israel has become this large nation ruled by David. And God asked David and his descendants to partner with him by leading Israel and obeying the laws and doing what is right and just. And God promises that one day, one of David's sons will come and extend God's kingdom of peace and blessing over all the nations. So those are the four covenants that God makes in order to restore his partnership with the whole world. But here's what happens. Israel breaks the covenant. They worship other gods. They allow horrible injustice. And so they lose their land and are forced off into exile. So it seems hopeless. But during this time, Israel's prophets talked about a day when God would restore these covenants in spite of Israel's failure somehow. Yeah, they called it the New Covenant. And this is actually what's so interesting about Jesus, is that he's introduced into this story as the one who fulfills all of these covenant relationships. We're told that he's from the family of Abraham, and so he will bring the blessings of that family to the whole world. We're told that he's the faithful Israelite who is able to truly obey the law. And we're told that he's the king from the line of David, and so he goes about extending God's kingdom of justice and peace to all. That's really remarkable for one guy. Yeah, and what it highlights is perhaps the most surprising claim of all made about this man, that Jesus is no mere human, but rather God become human. And God did this in order to be that faithful covenant partner that we are all made to be, but have failed to be. And so through Jesus, God has opened up a way for anyone to be in a renewed partnership with him. So Jesus calls people to follow him and become part of this new covenant family. And despite their failures, Jesus is committed to making them into partners who are becoming more and more faithful. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a fully renewed world, full of goodness and peace. And there's this renewed humanity there, partnering together with God to expand the goodness of his creation. And so the end of the Bible story is really a new beginning. There you go. Nice little review. Okay, so just to get into this, and we're going to just kind of review real quickly. Um, the top of your page two, we were looking at the place of the covenant. Um, why did God establish the covenant? What did we put down from weeks ago when we were looking at this? Anybody? Why did God establish this covenant? And you've got some passages there that could help you real quickly, but... To make Israel his treasured possession, right? And to make this treasured possession now to be the vehicle that is going to transform the, the understanding of the world about their sin and their need for a savior, their need for a God, okay? And then the second question that you've got there, you know, what way is the tabernacle related to the covenant which God is establishing? And we're going to kind of get, this is kind of precursor to the tabernacle. We're getting into the pieces, parts of it. Um, but anybody have anything written down from a couple weeks ago? Answer to that question? Yeah. You've basically got two things going on. God deals with his people um, the place where Israel is going to sacrifice or where they're going to have offerings. The sacrifices are exposing their covenant relationship or expressing their covenant relationship with him, but also making atonement for their sins. Okay? But then the offerings are showing their thanks and praise. 
Yeah? So, I mean, this is the place where God is going to come and dwell with his people, his people that he's just made this contractual agreement with. Yeah? Okay? So, what's interesting as we go through Exodus chapter 25 is if you were giving plans to your architect for the building of your new house, are you starting with the major structure and how you want it to look? Or are you starting with the elements on the inside first? What do you think most people would do? The outside. You're gonna talk about the shell, right? This is the shell. I want a ranch, I want a, I want a split level, I want a three story, I want an A-frame. Um, I want this color brick. I don't want any vinyl siding. It's I ought to be all real slate, you know, um, the whole nine yards. And then you go into the component pieces inside. I want the master bath to look like this. I want a place for my grandmother's credenza to go here. This is just the opposite. God goes into the pieces parts first, and then he describes what the tabernacle is going to look like. Interesting. So we looked at the ark first, okay? And that's what you've got in front of you right here. Made of acacia wood, colored, covered in gold, um, rods so that it can be carried, so that you, you cannot touch it or you will die, and then two cherubim on the top that face each other, okay? No one knows what the Ark of the Covenant looks like. All we have is the descriptions that are in the Bible for us, and we know that what was on the inside, what was stored on the inside? Tablets. The two tablets containing Aaron's the Ten rod. Commandments. Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod. It's a manna. Some manna. And that's the extent of it. Right there. Okay? Um, and that sat in the Holy of Holies, which we're going to look at when we finally get to the tabernacle, hopefully today. And I don't prattle on too long. But at the bottom of page two, we were just starting to, last time we were together, we got through a couple of these questions. It says, read below the passages and determine what the ark communicated to his people. And from that first Chronicles 28, this ark communicated the aspect to his people. This is God's footstool. And if this is God's footstool, what does that mean about God? What do, do you remember, does anybody have footstools at their house anymore? No. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Do you? Uh, <laughs> okay, so what is a footstool for? To help you when you don't have a very good balance, on it and put your shoes on. <laughs> okay, yeah, help you put your shoes on, which means that you're residing there. What else is a footstool used for? Rest your feet. feet. <laughs> you kick your feet up and you relax. So if this is God's footstool, this Ark of the Covenant, this is the place where God's chilling with his people. I don't mean to be disrespectful or common by that term, but he's, he's hanging out with his people, right? Remember, he's promised that he's going to communicate through the Urim and Thummim to Aaron when questions are asked of him. Yeah? But that's when we get to the priest's breastplate. The breastplate is holding what is called the Urim and Thummim, the great mystery device that whereby God communicates his answers to his people. But, so God's footstool. The second one, when we looked at 1 Samuel chapter 4, that is basically enthroned between the cherubim. Um, this is his throne. So not only is it his footstool, but his throne. But it also means he's with his people. Right? He's hanging out with them. Pablo page 3, when we looked at Exodus chapter 25, it's basically telling you again, God's presence with his people. Personified or symbolized <coughs> in this Ark of the Covenant. Leviticus chapter 16, um, again, God's presence. But this brings in the aspect from Leviticus of also God's judgment, okay? Um, his righteousness, his righteous and holy judgment. There are rights and wrongs, and there is a thing called absolute truth, right? And then finally what we looked at was Leviticus 16, chapter, or verse 14. Um, this is also the place that sin is atoned for, okay? So we got to this word atonement. And this is where we left off. Why is atonement cover an appropriate name for the lid of the ark? I want to look at just some words that we hear an awful lot. And I'm not really sure that we really understand with top of mind awareness 
what these words really mean, let alone give me a definition of atonement. So the word expiation, it stresses the payment that Jesus made so our sins are forgiven. Now, I realize that I'm leaping centuries forward into the New Testament, but all of these Old Testament sacrifices were nothing more and certainly nothing less than pictures of what the ultimate Messiah was going to do for God's people, right? They were looking ahead, yeah? So all the blood of beasts and bulls did not save anyone, right? The trust that Jesus, or that God made a promise to them, that, and they believed that promise, that's called faith. And that's what's saving them. Trust that God is going to keep his promise to you, right? But all the blood of beasts and bulls, as the writer to the Hebrews puts it, is really nothing more than just pointing, pointing forward to Jesus. So that expiation is the payment that Jesus made so our sins are forgiven. Where was the payment made? On the cross. At the end of this six-week season that we call... Lent. Lent. Which is where we are right now. This season where we have to take an oh too close for comfort look at the reason that Jesus had to die on the cross. Our sins. Yeah? And, and we can understand that phrase properly. But to say that Jesus, my sins nailed Jesus to the cross is really slighting Jesus of what? His willingness to go to that cross, whether you and I would acknowledge that our sins had to be paid for and atoned for and expiated for anyway. It, it sounds very romantic to say, um, my sins nailed Jesus to the cross. And we, I guess we can understand that properly. But if we're going to be theologically accurate here, my sins did not nail Jesus to the cross. Jesus allowed himself to be nailed to the cross willingly. Yeah? Um, don't put yourself too much in the driver's seat, good confessional Lutherans. Yeah? But I, I, I'm just... I'm just driving a point home, that's all. Just so that we, we are accurate in our understanding of expiation, propitiation, and atonement. Propitiation, if you add expiation and propitiation, stresses the right relationship now with God that results from Jesus' payment for our sin. Okay? So then if we go with atonement, so you add these two together if you're a mathematician, an atonement is the action of making amends for a wrong or an injury. That's what happened on Good Friday. That's what was proved to be true. Come days later on Easter Sunday. Yeah? That's why the Christian rejoices so much beyond words when you finally walk into church on Sunday. We've had no hallelujahs to sing the praises of our God for six whole weeks. Artificially imposed on us, yes, but the church has found that to be edifying for centuries. For two millennia. Yeah? We don't sing our hymns of praise, right? We don't sing glory be to the Father during Lent. And we go through then, finally, it all kicks off on Palm Sunday, and that Holy Week progresses, and we follow closely Jesus as he heads down to that cross, willingly, trudgingly going forward. It's interesting, the gospel lesson for this morning, against all opposition, you tell Herod that fox, I will go today and tomorrow and the next day. This is the God that we're reintroduced to during the season of Lent, that against all odds, we love an underdog story, right? Against all odds, against people who wanted nothing to do with him but to have his carcass put to death, right? He continues to proceed to that cross on Good Friday, to his slaughter, for them, and for us, yeah? And it just gives us this opportunity in the, in the church here to just focus on, on this 
what another dimension of this word grace, this word mercy, and it's all wrapped up in those three words right there, especially in atonement. Okay? So now I'm going to ask you, why is atonement cover an appropriate name for the lid of the ark? Well, what's inside of it? <laughs> the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, right? All of the do's and don'ts of God, right? All of God, do do this, love me, worship me, adore me, above all things, love God number one, love my name number one, love my worship number one, right? Love your parents, number two, because they represent me. And how many times do we make infractions against one of those Ten Commandments on any given day? More than we care to confess. Yeah, limitless, right? Okay, now, the priest goes in and he sprinkles blood on the atonement cover. Because without the, the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It tells us in Leviticus and Exodus in the book of Hebrews. Right? So now, if you're in God's space view, and you're looking down on your ark in your holy of holies, and you're looking down at the Ten Commandments, what do you see between the Ten Commandments and your sight? You see blood sprinkled. You see an atoning sacrifice for the sins that have been fra made infractions against those commandments, right? Do you think that anyone other than maybe the high priest made this connection? If at all? I bet he did. Moses is a pretty sharp guy. He at least knew how to make the image of a calf out of collected gold. Right? At the bottom of Mount Sinai. Bad decision. Yeah? So it is a fitting, it's a very fitting title for it. Um, in what way does Jesus fulfill what the ark was providing? And we're going to take a look at Hebrews chapter 9 here, verses 11 to 12. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. What does that question resonate with you? How might you answer that? In what way does Jesus fulfill what the ark was providing? Well, what was the ark providing? This was the vehicle that was God's footstool, God's presence, God's throne room, um, God's judgment, right? And it contains the Ten Commandments by which God's people are being held accountable. And God's people are in making infractions, sinning against those commandments on a daily basis, multiple times, right? And now God gives them a picture of how we're going to take care of this sin problem that you have, so that I don't have to destroy you. I'm going to have Moses and all the high priests that follow after that. We're going to go through this sacrificial process. And all the sins are going to go on a goat or a lamb or a bull. Right? All the sins of the priest, high priest. All the sins of the rest of the priests. All the sins of the people. And that lamb is going to be slaughtered. Right? Because without the shedding of blood, because that's the life of the animal, there is no forgiveness of sins. And now we're going to take that life of the animal and we're going to put to death the sins that would cause death to you. And we're going to symbolize that by sprinkling it on this place where I am and it contains my law that you have broken. And out of that death is going to come life. How does Jesus fulfill that? Is it just a, a, too, such, too, too obvious a question? Jesus. That is Jesus. That is a living, vivid, graphical picture in worship form of what the Messiah was finally going to come and do for God's people. In Christ is life. But on an infinite scale. But on an infinite scale. 
And it doesn't have to, he doesn't have to keep being re-sacrificed like the Old Testament priests had to go through to drive it into the people's heads. Right? Once for all. Even your boneheaded uncle who thinks that the Christian faith is nothing but a, a pipe dream. Right? Even for him. Yeah? Hang in there with him, though, because his deathbed time is coming. Yeah? And even the conversion of a thief on a cross at the last moment is better than an eternity in hell. Right? So. All right. Just wonderful picture. Great picture of what Jesus provided. Okay. Now we're going to turn the corner. We're going to take a look at the table for the showbread. And I'm going to ask, it's the top of page 4, Exodus 25, 23 to 30. And if you want to make a little note to yourself, because we're going to be jumping over some chapters when we get into the next lesson. Chapters 25 to 31, essentially in Exodus, <coughs> are the same as chapters 35 to 39. It gets repeated a little bit the second time around, okay? So can I get someone to read those verses for us? Make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make it gold molding around it. Also, make around it a rim, a handbreadth wide, and put a gold molding on the rim. Make four gold rings for the table, and fasten them to the four corners where the four legs are. <coughs> the rings are to be close to the rim to hold the poles using in carrying the table. Used in carrying the table. Make the poles of acacia wood Overlay them with gold and carry the table with them. And make its plates and dishes of pure gold as well as its, its pitches and bowls, bowls for the pouring out of, the, of offerings. Put the bread of the presence on this table to be before me at all times. Okay, thank you, Constantine. Now, there's two questions here that I have here for you. What's the purpose of this table? And the first one that you can, you can answer right now from the words that Constantine just shared with you. What's the practical purpose of this table? To put the bread and the, and the liquid on. Yeah, to, to, carry, to hold the 12 loaves of showbread, right? Um, the second question, you're not going to be able to answer yet because I need somebody to read these Leviticus passages that are going to follow. 25, 5 through 9. Oh, go ahead. Don't be shy. Take the pot. Right. Go ahead. Take the finest flour and bake twelve loaves of bread using two tenths of an inch flour for each loaf. Arrange them in two stacks, six in each stack, on the table of pure gold before the Lord. By each stack, put some pure incense as a memorial portion to represent the bread, and to be a food offering presented to the Lord. The bread is to be set out before the Lord regularly, Sabbath after Sabbath, on behalf of the Israelites as a lasting covenant. It belongs to Aaron and his sons who are to eat it in the sanctuary area because it is the most holy part of the sexual <coughs> share of the food offerings presented to the Lord. Thank you, Murray. Now, the second answer to, to the question is buried in there. But as you're scanning that, and I know you can multitask, um, why do you suppose there were 12 loaves of showbread? For the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah, yeah, which gives you an added insight now as to what's the second reason for this table. And, and the showbread that's included with it. Communion. Not communion. It's called well, a fellowship offering. Yeah, it's like a fellowship offering. It's, it's, it's establishing, what is, how does he put it? On behalf of the Israelites, as a lasting covenant. That's doing nothing more than assuring Israel of the Lord's presence among his people and representing Israel's continuing offer of thanks to him for their daily bread. There's that sacrifice and offering thing again going on. Yeah? And this is a way for them to show that he is with them and they are serving him and thanking him. This bread was replaced every single Sabbath. Now, I don't know how tasty it would have been <laughs> come Monday morning, right? After sitting out all week long. 
But this showbread was allowed then to be eaten by the priests, okay, along with any other meat sacrifices that would have come along that weren't just totally, like the burnt offering was totally consumed. The fellowship offering, they were allowed to have a part of that for their own family, but also then that's the, that's the little picnic with God offering, the fellowship offering. God is coming actually, the priest is representing God and he's coming and having food with you. He's having a meal with you. Isn't it interesting how the New Testament so promotes hospitality? <laughs> With Pastor Thompson and Christine, I'm really good at it. I'm not so good at that, because I kind of go home and I go, oh, people, right? <laughs> they need to just get away. But he's really good at that, inviting people into his home. I've got to get better at that. Um, but it's interesting how the New Testament reflects this, this hospitality that God wants to have with his people in the Old Testament. Yeah? So... All right, so bread for the Lord, what's the bread for the Lord? Number two, on behalf of the Israelites, is the lasting covenant, okay? Um, in what way are the two purposes of the table bread, two sides of the same coin? Is that just kind of too cryptic of a question for you at this hour? But I'll let it stew for just a second. In what way are the two purposes of the table bread, two sides of the same coin? Yeah? I don't mean to interrupt. Um, well, it's the same as a covenant. There's an expectation that you bring an offering when you commune with God or when you come to church or whatever. It's a small, maybe seemingly insignificant reminder of this covenant relationship that you have. I'm your God. I promise to be with you. I'm in the presence of this temple, right? I will be your God, you will be my people, and you're going you're gonna to serve me with this constant reminder. This is going to be one constant reminder of your, your, your offering to me, but my, more importantly, and thanks for the service that I'm giving to you. And it's going to be sim 12 simple loaves of flatbread. As simple as that, right? And he just keeps, when you start picking this apart, when you, when you start thinking... Um, I've had enough of Exodus, okay? Could you just give us the Cliff Notes version so we can be done in three weeks? You start looking at the details of the worship life of the Old Testament people. It's absolutely astounding the amount of detail that's built in this mechanism that God has given to these folks to, to reinforce, I am the God Almighty. Just like when he was bringing them out of Egypt, what was their main, what was his main message to Egypt, but also by default to the Israelite people. Do you remember? Pharaoh. Then he will know that I am the Lord. Right? Then they will know that God has been in their presence. Right? So, okay. Let's take a look now at Exodus 25. This <coughs> is going to be the lampstand. And According to church historian Eusebius, this thing was purportedly five feet high and had half, was four feet in diameter. Okay? So let's take a look at it. It's got seven. We're going to take a look at that in a second. But if I could get someone to read about the lampstand, Exodus 25, 31 to 40. Oh, don't be shy. <laughs> Make a lampstand of pure gold and hammer it out, base and shaft. Its flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms shall be of one piece with it. Six branches are to extend from the sides of the lampstand, three on one side and three on the other. Three cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms are to be on one branch. Three on the next branch, and the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstand there are to be four cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud shall be under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair, and a third bud under the third pair. Six branches in all. The buds and branches shall all be of one piece with the lampstand, hammered out of pure gold. Then make it seven lamps and set them up on it so that they light up the space in front of it. Its wick trimmers and trays are to be pure or pure gold. A talent of pure gold is to be used for the lampstand and all these accessories. 
see that, you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. The golden lamp stand provided the only light in the tabernacle that might possibly be communicated through the lampstand. Okay. I have searched and searched and searched, and I have not found a satisfying answer to the question, why does every single artist that represents this lampstand, including the menorah to this day, have seven candle holders? And Brian just read how many? Six. Six. Yeah. I, I don't have an answer. The, the best that I came up with is from the People's Bible, where it is presumed that the Jews, whoever crafted this, said, well, if you're going to have a candlestick, that's one already. That's one candlestick. And on each side of that lone candlestick, we're going to have three branches. So thus, the seven. But verse 37 says, make the seven lamps. Wouldn't the, wouldn't the middle the one seven, represent... This, but then you've got seven lamps within the inside of the um, temple area. We'll get so you've you got seven of these things. Yeah, yeah. That's what I thought when I first read it, too. And I looked up the Hebrew, and it's different. So these are, there's seven of these things inside of it. So I'm going to keep searching. We're going to be on Exodus for a while. This is not, you know, not going to break the deal of, of understanding the symbolism. But if you've got seven lamps or whether you've got seven holders, um, Lutherans are not overly big into numerology, but you can't read the book of Revelation without having to spend some time to figure out what do all these numbers mean. Like 10 is the number of completeness. Yeah. Can you say that the seven is a symbol? They represent the seven churches. The seven churches. You've got the seven churches in the book of Revelation at the beginning? Yeah. You've got a three inside of a seven, right? And the three would remind you first and foremost of? Uh, Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit. Okay? So three is the number of the Trinity. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Okay? If you've been to the study of Revelation, the number four is? Yeah, for the four points of the compass. Right? It's, it's a humanity. Right? So seven is just the number where the Trinity, the triune God, comes into contact with people, right? Which is just totally reinforcing everything that we've been studying this morning about God's presence with his people, God's footstool, right? The Holy of Holies. So just reinforcing that one more time. Okay. I'm going to keep searching, though. There's supposed to be six. It doesn't say seven. So, all right. If you, um, oh, the golden lamp provided the only light in the tabernacle, what might possibly be communicated through the lampstands? The lampstands should be. Your word is a lamp to my feet, your light to my path. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I am the light of the world, right? Um, and this light only comes from me, right? Um, there will be no sun. The, the lamb at the center of the throne will be its light, which is a kind of cool idea um, that's described in Revelation. So, okay, there's a mock-up um, of the tabernacle to the best of somebody's ability to be able to decipher uh, what's written in the Bible. Let's take a look at it. This is rather long, but I want you to actually read, be able to enjoy the whole thing here. Um, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get you started, and then someone be prepared to hop in. Make the tabernacle with ten curtains of finely twisted linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, with cherubim worked into them by a skilled craftsman. All the curtains are to be the same size, 28 cubits long and 4 cubits wide. Join five of the curtains together and do the same with the other five. Make loops of blue material along the edge of the end curtain in one set, and do the same with the end curtain in the other set. Make 50 loops on one curtain and 50 loops on the end curtain of the other set, with the loops opposite each other. Are you confused already? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Then make 50 gold clasps and use them to fasten the curtains together so that the tabernacle is a unit. 
Make curtains of goat hair for the tent over the tabernacle, 11 altogether. All 11 curtains are to be the same size. 30 cubits long and 4 cubits wide. How long is a cubit? 18 inches. Now, it's basically a man's arm from the elbow to that bone right there in your, in your, uh, at your wrist. Okay? About 30 centimeters. Right. Yeah, if you're a metric guy, it is. So it would be 45. 45. 45. 18 inches or 45 centimeters. Maybe your hand is longer than mine. That's the, <laughs> that's the problem with using an arbitrary measurement yes. like the cubit. Yeah, the cubit was whatever the king's length was. He was, he was the determiner. Make curtains of goat hair for the tent over the tabernacle, 11 altogether. All 11 curtains are to be the same size, 30 cubits long and 4 cubits wide. Join five of the curtains together into one set and the other six into another set. Fold the sixth curtain double at the front of the tent. Make 50 loops, oh here we go with the loops again. Make 50 loops along the edge of the end curtain in one set and also along the edge of the end curtain in the other set. Then make 50 bronze clasps and put them in the loops to fasten the tent together as a unit. As for the additional length of the tent curtains, the half curtain that is left over is to hang down at the rear of the tabernacle. The lent, the tent, the lent, the tent curtains will be a cubit longer on both sides. What is left will hang over the sides of the tabernacle so as to cover it. Make for a tent, make for the tent a covering of ram skins dyed red and cover or over that a covering of hides of sea cows. Make upright frames of acacia wood for the tabernacle. Each frame is to be 10 cubits long and a cubit and a half wide with two projections set parallel to each other. Make all the frames of the tabernacle in this way. Make 20 frames for the south side of the tabernacle and make 40 silver bases to go under them. Two bases for each frame, one under each projection. For the other side, the north side of the tabernacle, make 20 frames and 40 silver bases, two under each frame. Make six frames for the far end, that is, the west end of the tabernacle, and make two frames for the corners at the far end. At those, these two corners, they must be doubled from the bottom all the way to the top and fitted into a single ring. Both shall be like that. So there will be eight frames and 16 silver bases, two under each frame. Could someone just take the rest of this to the end? Also make crossbars of acacia wood, five for the frames on one side of the tabernacle, five for those on the other side, and five for the frames on the west at the far end of the tabernacle. The center crossbar is to extend from end to end at the middle of the frames. Overlay the frames with gold and make gold rings to hold the crossbars. Also overlay the crossbars with gold. Set up the tabernacle according to the plan shown you on the mountain. Make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen with cherubim worked into it by a skilled craftsman. Hang it with gold hooks on four posts of acacia wood overlaid with gold and standing on four silver bases. Hang the curtain from the clasps and place the Ark of the Testimony behind the curtain. The curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Put the atonement cover on the Ark of the Testimony <coughs> in the most holy place and place the table outside the curtain on the north side of the tabernacle and put the lampstand opposite on the south side. For the entrance to the tent, make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen, the work of an embroiderer. Make gold hooks for this curtain and five posts of acacia wood overlaid with gold and cast five bronze bases for them. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. architects and engineers, how long would it take you to go through that again and figure out what we're supposed to do? <laughs> Half a day? Two hours? Yeah. All right, the Hebrew word for tabernacle, uh, hamishkan, literally means dwelling place. Reading through the description of the tabernacle demonstrates that the tabernacle was a tent and was temporary. In what way do these two facts help you understand John chapter 1, verse 14? The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Okay, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In what way do these two facts help you better understand John chapter 1, verse 14? 
Remember, he's the fulfillment of all of this Old Testament imagery. But it's all a foreshadow. God came in Jesus and tented among you. Yeah? Well, apparently the people who lived in those times were very intelligent. They were able to understand these instructions and really build the stuff, such as the Ark of Noah as well. I know. Nowadays we are so blessed with YouTube. If you type how to change photo body of the sun, etc., and they show you to remove this screw, take out this hose, and you see how it does. Yeah. They did it without sin. I know. I know. All from words. Yeah. Right? What's the other thing you notice here? And this is just a little aside question. But we had the, um, the uh, almond flowers, right? Gold um, on the curtain and then verse 1 or verse 2 of what we just read about the camp, uh, um, tabernacle. You're also going to see what's supposed to be embroidered into the fabric. Cherubim. Cherubim. And what colors are they? <coughs> blue and purple, blue and scarlet. Yeah. Um, what is this picture starting to form for you? When you go inside this tabernacle, or even when you see it from the outside, what, what is it supposed to remind you of? Heaven. Garden of Eden. Right? Back. Back to the what? The glory of God. The glory of God. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, before we get to the altar, I'm just going to share a couple uh, pics with you. Um, this is one that you can find on the internet. Um, this is the half size. This is about one half the size. There's an American football field, which is smaller than a Canadian football field. Obviously, we all know that. Um, but since most of our graphics come from America, um, it's obvious. And here's the size of, the rough size of <coughs> the porch of the tabernacle compared to the American football field. But it's about half the size of Solomon's temple. Um, so there's another one. And there's supposed to be seven of those lampstands. So I don't know why they're not picturing it. It's hard to find good graphics. Um, the Holy of Holies was 10 cubits deep, 10 cubits wide, 10 cubits high. 10 is just the number of fulfillment. Um, about as, as close as God can get to perfection. Right? Thank you, Constantine. So um, I've got a city laid out like a square as long as it was wide. Um, <coughs> the picture you get from the book of Revelation. So... Let's take a look real quickly at the, uh, the altar. Um, Exodus 27, 1 through 8. Build an altar of acacia wood three cubits high. It is to be square, five cubits long and five cubits wide. Make a horn at each of the four corners so that the horns and the altar are one piece and overlay the altar with bronze. Make all its utensils of bronze, its pots to remove the ashes and its shovels, sprinkling bowls, meat forks, and fire pans. Make a grating for it bronze network and make a bronze ring at each of the four corners of the network. Put it under the ledge of the altar so that it is halfway up the altar. Make poles of acacia wood for the altar and overlay them with bronze. The poles are to be inserted into the rings so they will be on two sides of the altar when it is carried. Make the <coughs> altar hollow out of boards. It is to be made just as you were shown on the mountain. Um, before I get to the question, why is this one not made up covered with gold? It's not in the most holy place. Right. Yeah. And obviously, um, we need something a little bit more durable going on here. Right? I don't so, think you can burn things on gold. It melts too easily. Yeah. yeah. Melts way too easily. Um, it's the also symbolic of that step. That was from the most holy place. Yeah. Yeah. The altar was the place where the animal and grain offerings were burned. And Leviticus 6, 12 tells us that the coals were never to go out. Those coals had to constantly be going, 24-7. Never supposed to go out at all. So. They were in, well, traveling through the desert, they had to carry it. 
They had to carry it with hot coals. Apparently. It would seem. Now I'm trying to verify that. Or is it just during the time when they have the tabernacle actually set up and consecrated now for holy use? Now the coals can't go out. I'm trying to find out. There's so much that we don't know. There's so many questions that we just can't, we don't have answers. Um, where is the tabernacle in the new covenant? Well, I'm going to give you this. Um, Ephesians 2, 21 to 22. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And then Hebrews 9, it was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Where is the tabernacle in the New Testament covenant if we use that tabernacle term? Keep going. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's us. It's us. Where is heaven? Where is the kingdom of heaven? Another dimension. It's in another dimension. And the other place where the kingdom of heaven is? It's in, in each our us. spirit. It's in each of us. It's in each one of us. When the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart, the kingdom of heaven is inside of you. Christ is living inside of you. There's the tabernacle. If you want to think of yourself as a walking, talking tabernacle of the New Testament, you're it. Right? Because remember, the whole point of this tabernacle is this is God's presence with his people. Yeah? Okay. That concludes lesson 13. I can't believe I actually got through one lesson in one day. I'm endeavoring to do that. But Dr. Just, just one comment. Our Pentecostal uh, friends, they frequently use tabernacle as, as their name for their churches, right? They do. Yeah. And, and it's not such a bad idea. But we just don't talk that way. You know? We call our worship places church. Yeah? <coughs> so, or cathedral or basilica or, or particular style. Alright, any questions that I've left you with? Lenny? In your head? Brian? Um, you were talking about God being with us. How come some people I've met all over the years have told me that I became a Christian or uh, I found God mm -hmm. on the 10 o'clock in the morning on the March 17th, 19, whatever. And other people don't know. They know by what they're taught that God is in them and he loves them and he's part of the family or well, you're part it's not of the family. Like, yeah. But you just don't have that I was saved this moment attitude. Is that right or wrong? Or I don't know how to understand it. That's all. Lutherans don't talk that way. Why? Grace. It's about by grace. By grace it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Right. right? So it's all your your you being a tabernacle of the of the Holy Spirit, right? Is a total gift of God alone, right? Does it seem as though? You are the one who says, I believe that Jesus is my Savior. Every time that word, um, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, Paul says to the uh, jailer in Philippi. Um, we had this conversation. That believe is in a passive voice. That means that you're the recipient of some other action outside of you acting upon you. Right? Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No one can say that Jesus Christ is the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Right? Lutherans have always taught that, because the scriptures have taught, that we don't make a decision to believe, right? Even when you read a devotion from the meditations, and that and the NPH editor will allow it to go through, um, and you accept, I still think that that's too active of a word. You, you accepted Jesus as your savior. I think the closest you can get to that passive form of belief is to use the word receive. Yeah? The church fathers or, or um, 
Martin Luther. Faith is this, this hand that God, God puts life into. Right? And, and, it's, and he went, went on, and, that's even a dead and lifeless hand. I mean, it's not even like you're putting the hand out. It's a dead and lifeless hand. And God is placing life into it. Right? But you can understand why people think that way. Because all they see is, I'm, I'm responding to a message from the preacher. I'm hearing Billy Graham now show me my sin and call me up to the altar to respond to that. And I believe, I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. And it was the 13th of March, 2017. And I think it was somewhere around 10.58, 10.59 in the morning. And I'm never going to forget that moment because that's the day that Jesus saved me. Praise God that that man is saved. We just don't talk that way because of why? The Bible doesn't talk that way. Then why doesn't the Bible talk that way? Faith is a gift of God, not from us. Faith, so is faith, a gift faith of... comes from God, not from us. So, so God chooses us, we don't choose him. That's right. That's right. It's also an emphasis on what you are feeling. It is. Rather than what God has done for you. Yeah. Um, it gives glory to the Holy Spirit who should be getting the glory for saving our wretched carcass. Right? And so you don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Right? Well, no doubt. No, no. And you totally understand grace and mercy then. So, so where does free will fit into all that? Man has no free will when it comes to spiritual matters. None. You're oh. spiritually dead. That's why you also can't make a decision for Jesus. You have no spiritual free will. Right. Wow, that's, that's almost scary, isn't it? I don't know. It's not, it's not scary at all. No? It's all up to the grace and mercy of a loving God that wants to save you in Christ. But so why, why is there so much talk about free will when we don't have any? You have free will to wear that red hoodie instead yeah, yeah, of the yeah. blue one. But I mean, in a spiritual sense. Well, where does it talk about free will in a spiritual sense? Find me some verses this week and let's talk about it next week. Well, Pastor, we only have free will to reject. You, that's not even free will. That's you're hardwired to reject. <laughs> Maybe this is just because we did talk a bit about this right with the last few weeks, oh. and I was trying to emphasize as strong as possible, right, that Adam and Eve right. had free will. Yes, right. right. And now, as regenerated Christians, we yes. have. Free will, right? That's being restored slowly, right? But we can't talk apart from the Holy Spirit. But there's the ability to do good, right? You guys should sit in on your classes instead of the time at the Sunday school with your kids upstairs. Not to. No, no, no. That's fine. Yeah. Save my. I mean, once you've been saved in your life of sanctification. Um, you have the Brahma Bull Holy Spirit doing most of the work, and you have this little bit of free will. You want to do God's will, right. right? But the Holy Spirit is still doing the, the lion's share of the work through oh, your life. Yeah, I don't believe that. Yeah? yeah? So. so. Thank you for allowing me all these minutes of your time. No <laughs> problem. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, I'm going to let you go because I'm going to get ready for worship.